Hi everyone, welcome back to Notes from Dan, the Chop Saver Guy. I am Dan Gosling, the Chop Saver Guy, and this is number two. Yay! The second of who knows how long this will go on. A second in a series, we'll call it, of short videos um, talking about Chop Saver, the product, what many consider to be the world's greatest lip balm, and the whole story behind it, and things that I've learned uh, along the way. Uh, the first video was just a super quick um, rundown of my biography, uh, where I grew up, Elkhart, Indiana. My desire to play the trumpet for a living did uh, eventually pan out quite well. In fact, I, I moved to Indianapolis after getting my degrees um, from the University of Illinois and Northwestern University in trumpet performance. Studied with some amazing teachers during those times, uh, but 1985, it was time to graduate and start playing somewhere. Um, mainly a classically trained, I played a fair amount of jazz in high school and in college, but knew that my bread and butter would be um, more in the classical realm. Moved to Indianapolis in, uh, again, 1985, and was quite fortunate to start playing uh, with uh, the Indianapolis Symphony as a substitute and extra player. Um, Several years after that, I also managed to be, get on the uh, substitute list for the Cincinnati Symphony um, and the Louisville Orchestra. So there was a time there where I was doing a fair amount of traveling in and around Indianapolis. But it was brass quintets, it was church gigs, it was weddings, it was students uh, in my own private studio. Also taught for a time at Ball State University as an adjunct and also taught at Bali University as an adjunct professor for several years. So it's that kind of crazy combination of things that freelance musicians get into where you've got some students, you have several uh, musical organizations that you can rely on that will hire you on a regular basis. Uh, in Indianapolis, there's actually a uh, recording scene, uh, studio recording scene. And that combined with the, the church gigs and the smaller orchestras, the regional orchestras, I was quite, quite busy. Within a year and a half, I was uh, fully employed, self-employed as a musician. I was quite proud of that. So aside from having a university position with a full salary and or having a full-time job in a major symphony orchestra, this is what many musicians uh, end up doing. Um, and it's a wonderful way to make a living. It's a great career. You have variety, you have, um, you play with different colleagues uh, week to week. You're not always playing with the same people. You know, those are some of the pros. Some of the cons are, you know, your, your, your um, income can fluctuate. You have to, there's some seasonality to it. You're crazy busy in December and wondering when the next check is gonna come in in uh, October and, and uh, I mean, August and September, time, things like that. But the more you do it, you kind of get used to that rhythm. Um, and it does teach you how to uh, budget and manage your money and things like that. So I was in the sense of managing my own affairs and, and not having a boss, have always been uh, self-employed. The Chop Saver story started, um, golly, again, this was after, you know, a couple of decades of, of playing the trumpet and uh, playing in great organizations and playing with some amazing players um, really fortunate to play, like I said, a lot with the Indianapolis Symphony. I uh, did some recordings with the Cincinnati Symphony, which are still highlights of my career. Um, but the Chop Saver story really centered around one conversation that I had with a former uh, a, a student of mine uh, that I'm still dear friends with. His name was Wesley Bullock. But I should probably back up a little bit from that fateful conversation, which I'll tell more about maybe in the next video. But leading up to that conversation, what happened to me was I was playing, as I mentioned, a lot with Indianapolis Symphony to the point where they offered me a one-year contract to play with the orchestra on a full-time basis to fill a chair for a gentleman who had retired and they had not had an audition yet, which is common in uh, orchestra settings. So I said, sure, I'll take that one-year salary and the paid vacation and, and all the other things that come along with it. I did that for a year. One year turned into two, two years turned into three. So now I'm a regular member 
of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra for now three years running. And prior to this, I had been subbing with them a lot. So I was well known, I was well liked, I think, uh, respected, and filling this chair in the orchestra now, not just as an extra, but as a full-time member. But with years and years and years of service prior to that, the way it works in American symphony orchestras is you still have to take an audition to win a job. And I knew that going in. I knew that was part of the deal, that I was going to have this job for what turned out to be three seasons and then still have to audition to win the job outright. And that's a common thing. There are many men and women who've had similar stories to mine. And sometimes they win the job and sometimes they don't. And I don't wanna say fortunately or unfortunately, I mean, as it turned out, I did not win that job. Um, now at the time, it was devastating because I had, again, had the job for three years, did my level best to win the job in the audition. But as people who have been through this process or have played in symphony orchestras will tell you, uh, winning an audition and playing in an orchestra are two different things. And I was quite good at playing in an orchestra. The skill set of playing in an orchestra and winning a job for an orchestra are quite different. Doesn't mean they can't combine, of course. Obviously, there are great people who have, great musicians who have won the audition and gone on to wonderful orchestral careers. But the skill set and what's needed to win an audition, especially for someone like me, who at that time had not, not taken an audition in, in many, many years, to get back into the audition mindset uh, is a challenge. Um, gave him my best shot. Did not win the job. As it turned out, the young man who did win the job was Tom Hooten. If you don't know the name Tom Hooten and you're a trumpet player, uh, you should. Tom is now the principal trumpet of the LA Philharmonic, Los Angeles Philharmonic. Tom's one of the great orchestra, one of the great trumpet players in the world. So that's the dude that beat me, okay? Um, if I was gonna lose that job, I lost it to someone fair and square, you know, a world-class player. Tom eventually went on to become principal trumpet of the Atlanta Symphony, uh, and then now the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And he is quite active, as you maybe some of you already realize, the musicians, the trumpet players out there, very active on Instagram, Facebook, um, putting out his content, his knowledge, in ways that are just astounding to me. And just shout out to, to Tom. Tom is a good friend. He's also happens to use Chopsticker. Just thought I'd throw that in there. But I'm devastated. Now I have to kind of piece together my, my, my life as a freelance musician. But the idea of, oh geez, I've had this for three years. At this time I, had a, I was married, I had been married for 15 years to that point. My wife, Noelle, um, still married, still happily married. Uh, as a violinist, but we also had a young son at the time, so it was tough. So I think I'm going to end this video right here and tell the whole story about how Chop Saber happened a few weeks after that devastating day. Stay tuned for that. Thank you for watching.